fearing that her servants would make bold with her if they knew her husband was gone, Budur put on some of Kamar's clothes and a turban like his and veiled the lower part of her face and departed and no one discovered her identity for she resembled Kamar so much that everyone took her for him. She journeyed to the city of Ebony where the king said to her, I've not been blessed with a son but I have one daughter whose face and body resemble yours in beauty and grace. Will you be willing to live in my country? I'll marry you to my daughter and give you the kingdom. Budor as Kamar agreed to this, but when she failed to consummate the marriage, the princess Hayat said, is every beautiful person so conceited? I'm not saying this to make you desire me, but I'm saying it out of fear for you from the king, for he has resolved that if you don't take my virginity and consummate the marriage tonight, he will depose you and banish you from his country. He may even become more enraged and kill you. When Budor as Kamar revealed that she was a woman, Hayat said, I will not divulge your secret. She took a chicken, slaughtered it, and smeared herself with blood. Then she took off her pants and cried out. The women of her family went into her and her waiting women let out a trilling cry of joy. After some time, Kamar found in the craws of a dead bird the jewel that was the cause of his separation from his wife. He hid it in a cask of gold on a ship that was to take him to the city of Ebony, but the ship sailed without him, and when it landed, Budoras Kamar, now king of the Ebony Islands, found the jewel. Through it she discovered Kamar's whereabouts and sent her men to capture him and bring him to her. When Kamar arrived, Budor as Kamar said to him, I love you for your surpassing beauty and grace. And if you grant me my desire, I will grant you favors, make you prosperous, appoint you vizier, just as the people made me king in spite of my youth. When Kamar heard this, he felt embarrassed and blushed until his cheeks seemed on fire. And he said, I have no need of favors that lead to sin. Budur's Kamar kept arguing with him, reciting many obscene verses about men who prefer sex with boys to sex with women. At last, Kamar said, your majesty, if you must do it, promise me that you will do it to me only once. He opened his trousers, feeling extremely embarrassed and shedding tears in fear. Budur as Kamar smiled, took him with her to bed and said, after tonight you will experience nothing offensive again. When Kamar discovered that she lacked male genitals, he said to himself, perhaps this king is a hermaphrodite, being neither male nor female. So he said to her, your majesty, you don't seem to be like other men. What then moved you to carry on like this? When Budur as Kamar heard this, she laughed until she fell on her back. And she said, oh my darling, how quickly you have forgotten the nights we spent together. Then she revealed herself to him and he recognized her as his wife, Budur. So he embraced her, and she embraced him, and he kissed her, and she kissed him, and they made love. Then he began to remonstrate with her saying, what made you treat me like this tonight? She replied, do not reproach me, for I only did it in jest to increase the pleasure and joy. He married Hayat, and Budur, who was not jealous, willingly became her maidservant and co-wife. He conducted himself in a praiseworthy way toward his people and lived with his wives in happiness and delight and fidelity and cheerfulness, spending one night with each in turn. And in some versions of the Arabian Nights, which exist in many different variants, there's no single original one, in some versions, the story ends there, but many of them add this second very brief piece, one more paragraph. But when the two women bore and raised sons, each woman fell in love with the other's son, propositioned him, was rejected, and accused the boy of rape. Kamar believed the women at first and ordered the boys killed, but they were spared and proved their innocence with the help of Budur's father and Kamar's father. Budur returned to her father's kingdom and her son ruled there, while Hayat's son ruled on the throne of her father, and Kamar al-Zaman went back and ruled his father's kingdom. That story takes about 150 pages in the Arabian Nights. <laughs> now let's talk about the role of beauty in this complex tale. 
Though Kamar longs for Budor as much as she longs for him, it is she who takes the active role in bringing them together on both occasions. Yet she never has to prove who she is. It is Kamar who must prove his identity. Budur, by contrast, remains disguised as she takes political power and forces Kamar into a bed that he loathes, for he thinks it is the bed of a man. Budur looks so like her husband that she can take his place. What does Kamar think when Budur's Kamar drags him into bed? That he's looking into a mirror? That every good-looking person looks just like him? The fact that her natural resemblance to her husband allows Budor to play the role of a man, her man, lends this version of the story an unusual symmetry, which is foreshadowed from the very start when each desires the other at first sighting, but fails to awaken the other and hence cannot satisfy his or her desire. And throughout the story they do similar things. He uses the blood of a horse to fake his death. She uses the blood of a chicken to face to fake the, the consummation of the wedding and so forth. The resemblance between the two lovers is particularly striking because they're not only not related by blood at all, so that family resemblance cannot explain the likeness, but are not even of the same ethnic background. He is presumably Arabian and she Chinese. And Budo resembles not only Kamar, but the daughter of the king who takes her to be a boy, presumably a dark-skinned woman from the Ebony Isles. The hegemony of beauty and grace, as it's referred to in the story, erases not only the difference between individuals, but the difference between genders, and transcends even the boundaries of ethnicity. It is a supreme quality. Although we end up with the official normal Middle Eastern combination of a man, Kamar, who sleeps with two women, Hayat and Bodur, the narrative brings us there through the far from normal detour of an apparent man, Budur as Kamar, who pretends to sleep first with a woman, Hayat, who thinks she is a man, same sex, different gender, and then with a man, Kamar, who thinks she is a man, same gender, different sex. Kamar, at the very start of the story, does not like women. He argues that he will not marry because he has heard verses about the cunning of women. And you remember this is part of the Arabian Nights, the frame story of which is that of a king who hates women and assumes that they're all unfaithful. And Scheherazade, who tells him stories night after night, proves to him that, as the story ends, some women are faithful. So this is the, the given misogyny of the text. Kamar's expectations are then more than met by the elaborate trick that his wife plays upon him, while citing precisely the sort of verses that Kamar must have had in mind. And each of the translators of the Arabian Nights writes different obscene verses at this point. So Richard Burton had a field day with them, and the French and German translations write different obscene verses because everyone makes up their own Arabian Nights. Kamar's actions speak louder than his words. He keeps protesting that he loves her, but he does turn his back on her in bed on their first meeting. He does walk out on her after their marriage, and he has to be dragged, kicking, and screaming into bed with her at the end, thinking that she is a man. But still, he doesn't recognize her, even when he recognizes her genitals. <laughs> Boudour may well blame Kamar for having left her and robbed her. She comments blandly, it seems that he has taken the jewel and gone, as well as for turning his back to her in bed on their first encounter. This unexpressed or repressed resentment may best explain her quite evident sadistic pleasure in tormenting both Hayat and Kamar. Budur's Kamar is quite willing to humiliate the entirely innocent Hayat. When Budur fails to consummate the marriage with Hayat, just as Kamar had failed to consummate his first assignation with Budur, Hayat wonders, is every beautiful person so conceited? She's wrong about the primary reason for Budur's rejection of her, but not entirely wrong. Budur's narcissism limits the field of her lovers, not to herself, but to someone who closely or exactly resembles her. But it is Kamar whom Budur as Kamar truly humiliates when he thinks she is the king. Her own rather lame excuse, I only did it in jest, explains nothing but the pleasure that the trickster takes 
and manipulating others and keeping them in the power of the trickster's knowledge and the victim's ignorance. The closeted sexual motive seemed to me to make the best sense of this twisted story. She plays the trick on her husband in order to exert power over him as he had exerted power over her, to put him, and as she feared from the start that her husband would do, to put him in danger of being raped, just as his absence had put her in danger of being raped. And his initial rejection of her had left her with the suspicion that he might have raped her in his, her sleep. Quote, you came to me while I was asleep and I do not know what you did to me. Other men in other stories, notably Siegfried with Brunhilde, and this book has stories of all over the world uh, like this. Other men in other stories, such as Siegfried with Brunhilde, exchange rings with sleeping women. Are these exchanges symbolic of rape? What does it mean then to take the maiden head or the ring from a sleeping woman? The tale of Kamar and Budur conflates the two sexual extremes in two different ways. First, a mock rape as a revenge for rejection, Budur as Kamar with Kamar, and then the accusations of rape and revenge for rejection, the son's calumny against the two queens. Budur's revenge extends into the last part of the story when she betrays him, when she betrays Kamar by claiming that she has slept with his son by the other woman. The blithe statement that Kamar lived with his wives in happiness and delight and fidelity and cheerfulness, spending one night with each in turn, evokes the Middle Eastern tradition that goes spectacularly awry in the Hebrew Bible story of Rachel and Leah, and fares little better, better here, where the fidelity and cheerfulness is certainly short-lived. The women proposition one another's sons are rejected and cry rape. We know this as the Potiphar's wife scenario in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis 39, reprocessing rejection as rape. And it is one of the reasons for the frequent conflation of these two aspects of sex which appear to be polar opposites, rape and rejection. The fact that the solution to all of this transvestism and quasi-incest is to send the women home to live with their fathers might give a Freudian pause. But Kamar too ends up in his father's realm. And it was in order to return to his father that Kamar left Budur in the first place. Here I think the return to the fathers indicates little more than one more example of the virulent misogyny, and in this case the literal patriarchy of the story. But it is the narcissism rather than the misogyny that contributes most to our understanding of this permutation of the theme for such excessive self-regard is surely one of the sources of self-imitation. If you cannot think of anyone you like better than yourself, why imitate anyone else? Moreover, since Kamar exactly resembles Budor, in imitating him, she is imitating herself. The love of Budor and Kamar for partners who resemble them demonstrates the devastating self-reflexivity of narcissistic love. Budur is so beautiful that everyone who sees her is jealous even of himself, says the text. I remark, I, I left that out of the telling, but it's in the same story. Everyone who sees her is jealous even of himself. A remark suggestive of the sexual transformations that allow a prince in a contemporary Indian story to make love to his own left half. They are alike, too, in the incestuous overtones of their narcissism. Before Budor and Kamar meet, neither wishes to marry. On the surface, they have very different reasons. He distrusts all women while she doesn't want to give up her freedom. But deeper down, we encounter the same reason in both of them. He admires only his mother, the text tells us, while she prefers her father to any other husband or lover. Quote, anyone that did not know the king or father of this incomparable princess would be apt to imagine from the great respect and kindness he shows her that he was in love with his daughter. Never did lover do more for a mistress, the most most endearing, than he has been seen to do for her. In a word, never was jealousy more watchful over one than he is over her." End quote. The narcissistic self replaces the self, projects the self onto all other love objects, resembles them, and finally, becomes them. Beauty plays a very similar role in the story of the two viziers, which is probably older than the tale of Budur. 
In both stories, one male and one female jinn catch sight of a beautiful woman and a beautiful man who are asleep in far distant cities. The jinns think that A, each is surpassingly beautiful, the male jinn admires the woman, the female jinn the man, and B, they look alike. The theme of narcissism and of a single non-gendered standard of beauty is thus a basic underpinning of both plots. The jinns bring the lovers together for one night and then part them again, leaving them to find one another in both stories. But in the two viziers, the lovers consummate their love on the first night, whereas Kamar and Budur do not. And in the two viziers, there's no ring. Instead, there is an elaborate series of tests by which the hero proves that he was in bed with the woman. The taste of the pomegranate he cooks, the reconstruction of an entire room that he recognizes, and so forth. This contrast is an indication that the ring and the tale of Budor, however muted, still bears a major proportion of the weight of the proof of identity. And it is Budor who masterminds that proof, for she's the one who breaks out of the initial convention situa conventional situation of amazing physical identity with her lover to become a most unconventional woman and someone quite different from him in every way, more active, more powerful, and more deceptive. Yet she can only accomplish her goal of union with him by pretending to be him, using her cleverness to play upon the convention of their identical beauty. So that's part one. Part two, real fake necklaces. Let us now jump over hundreds of years and thousands of miles to 19th and 20th century Europe and consider the question of fake jewelry. What is it that connects an anxiety about the authenticity of fake jewelry with an anxiety about the authenticity of fake women, which is to say untrue, unfaithful, promiscuous, and above all, beautiful women? Why are diamonds a girl's best friend? More precisely, what kind of a girl is it who thinks diamonds are her best friend? Normally, fake diamonds pretend to be real. Guy de Maupassant in the necklace, La Parure, 1885, told of a poor woman named Mathilde who borrowed a diamond necklace from her rich friend, Madame Forestier, so that she could wear it to enhance and show off her beauty at a ball that would introduce her into society. This was going to make her fortune. She lost the necklace and <coughs> purchased for 36,000 francs an identical replacement which she returned to the owner without telling her of the su substitution. Madame Forestier did not notice any difference. Mathilde ruined her beauty and her life by putting herself and her husband in hard labor for 10 years to repay the money they had to borrow to buy the replacement. Years later, Mathilde confessed to Madame Forestier what she had done, whereupon Madame Forestier told her that the necklace she had borrowed was a fake worth only 500 francs. Neither of the women could tell the difference between the real thing and the fake. Mathilde mistook the fake for real and Madame Forestier the real for the fake. <coughs> Thus, real diamonds stood in for the fakes that had stood in for real diamonds. When J. Reed Gould adapted this story for his one-act play in 1969, he had Madame Forestier remark to Mathilde at the end, with hard-hearted French or perhaps American logic, who would lend someone a real necklace? We keep it safe under lock and key. So that's the American contribution to the story. And in parallel to the shift from a real necklace to a fake necklace, the one real thing that Matilda has, her beauty, is destroyed by the jewelry, by the need to work so hard to repay the debt that her beauty is ruined. Guy de Maupassant also had written a year earlier in 1884 another story about a real necklace that pretended to be a fake called Les Bijoux, often translated the fake jewels. A married woman had an uncanny knack of stretching the meager household budget to produce luxuries, including a great deal of fake jewelry. After her death, her husband discovered with a shock that her apparently fake jewelry was real. 
The shock came from his assumption that if the jewels were real, they must have been received for services rendered, and that the woman, therefore, must have been false. But he got over the shock, cheerfully sold the jewelry, and lived in luxury with a second, more virtuous wife. <laughs> this was a basic theme which other authors could dance their own original variations on. Henry James, in 1899, reversed the tone of Les Bijoux in his story entitled Paste. <clears throat> Let me just do it this. Arthur Prime had inherited the estate of his father, who, as a widowed cleric, a vicar, had conceived for an obscure actress several years older than himself an admiration that led to marriage. Now both of them were dead. Arthur offered his stepmother's fake jewels, stage jewels, to his cousin Charlotte, a governess. The jewels, much lighter than the material they imitated, were too dreadfully good to be true. Flagrant tinsel and glass, they looked strangely vulgar, shameless pinchbeck. And of course, like everyone else, Charlotte knew that her aunt had had no jewelry to speak of. But the necklace of pearls, as big as filberts, was surprisingly heavy, and she commented on this to Arthur. Are you sure, very sure, they're not really worth something? He replied brusquely, if they had been worth anything to speak of, she would long ago have sold them. Besides, how could she ever have come by them? If they were real, presumably she must have received them from some wealthy man. Charlotte accepted all the jewels, including the pearls, and thought nothing of them until a woman of the world, Mrs. Guy, saw them and insisted that the pearls were in fact real. Furious at the shadow that Charlotte's decision cast on his stepmother's character, Arthur insisted they're rotten paste and determined to take them to Bond Street to have them appraised. He wrote to Charlotte that she had insulted his stepmother, that the experts had determined that he was right and pronounced them utter paste and that he had smashed them. But when she next met Mrs. Guy, Charlotte saw that she was wearing the pearls. Mrs. Guy said she had recognized them in the window of a Bond Street jeweler who must have purchased them from Arthur and had bargained for them. In the end, Charlotte wondered if Mrs. Guy hadn't gotten them from Arthur. And that final line implies, I think, that Arthur, who had been so horrified to think that his aunt might have received jewelry for sexual favors, gave the pearls to Mrs. Guy, a woman of the world, in precisely such a transaction. W. Somerset Maugham's story entitled Mr. Knowall, published in 1925, shares the assumption that underlies the de Maupassant and James stories, but brings in other interesting issues. The narrator seems to be anti-Semitic, and one of the issues that I wonder about is whether the narrator is an anti-Semite that Maugham doesn't like, or whether Mom shares his opinions of the Jews. It's hard to tell from the story, but listen to it. The story begins, I was prepared to dislike Max Calada even before I knew him. Max Calada is a Jew who pretends to be English. The narrator, who is forced to room with him on a transatlantic voyage, regards him as a fake gentleman. Quote, King George has many strange subjects. Mr. Calado was short and of sturdy build, clean-shaven and dark-skinned, with a fleshy, hooked nose and very large, lustrous and liquid eyes. His long black hair was sleek and curly. He spoke with a fluency in which there was nothing English, and his gestures were exuberant. I felt pretty sure that a closer inspection of that British passport of his would have betrayed the fact that Mr. Calada was born under a bluer sky than is generally seen in England. So that's what the narrator thinks of Mr. Calada. Max Calada is an obnoxious and self-promoting nuisance and everyone calls him Mr. Knowall. One night at dinner with a Mr. Ramsey and his wife, a very pretty little thing, who has been alone in New York for a year during her husband's absence in Japan, Mr. Calada comments on Mrs. Ramsey's pearls, pearl necklace. When Ramsey remarks, I didn't buy it myself, of course, I'd be interested to know how much you think it cost, Calada estimates $30,000. Then, and now I quote, Ramsey smiled grimly. 
You'll be surprised to learn that Mrs. Ramsey bought that string at a department store the day before we left New York for $18. When Kalana insists that the pearls are real, Ramsey bets him $100 that they're imitations. Over Mrs. Ramsey's protest, Kalada examines the pearls with a magnifying glass he has in his pocket. Then, and I quote, a smile of triumph spread over his smooth and swarthy face. He handed back the chain. He was about to speak. Suddenly, he caught sight of Mrs. Ramsey's face. It was so white that she looked as though she were about to faint. She was staring at him with wide and terrified eyes. They held a desperate appeal. It was so clear that I wondered why her husband didn't see it. Mr. Collada stopped with his mouth open. He flushed deeply. You could almost see the effort he was making over himself. I was mistaken, he said. It's a very good imitation, but of course, as soon as I looked through my glass, I saw that it wasn't real. I think $18 is just about as much as the damn thing's worth. He took out his pocketbook and from it a hundred dollar bill. He handed it to Ramsey without a word. Perhaps that'll teach you not to be so cocksure another time, my young friend, said Ramsey as he took the note. I noticed that Mr. Kalada's hands were trembling. The story spread over the ship as stories do and he had to put up with a good deal of chaff that evening. It was a fine joke that Mr. Nowall had been caught out. But Mrs. Ramsey retired to his, her stateroom with a headache. The next morning, an envelope arrives in Collada's stateroom with nothing but a hundred dollar bill. The narrator asks him, were the pearls real? And Collada replies, if I had a pretty little wife, I shouldn't let her spend a year in New York while I stayed at Kobe. And the story ends with this two sentences. At that moment, I did not entirely dislike Mr. Kalada. He reached out for his pocketbook and carefully put in it the $100 note. It's a great story. So by faking an opinion that the pearls are fake, by saying falsely that the real pearls are false, Kalada simultaneously saves the woman's reputation and ruins his own. He behaves like a real gentleman he shows that he himself is as real as the pearls, but nobody, with the exception of the narrator and you, gentle reader, knows this. They all go on believing that the pearls and Mr. Know-all are fakes and the woman is real. And to me, the, the element of anti-Semitism in the story is, is a parallel to misogyny in the other stories. These are disadvantaged people without power who are finding their way through the fakery of jewelry to a position of respectability. So she goes up when he goes down. Mom, in 1943, wrote a satire on his own story. He wrote a story called A String of Beads, this is the last story I'll tell you, which a narrator tells to Mom. A governess standing in at a dinner party for a fashionable woman who had canceled at the last minute was wearing a string of pearls that an expert at the dinner insisted was genuine, worth 50,000 pounds, though the governess strenuously insisted that she had paid only 15 shillings for it. Here the person telling the story to Mom remarks, we all laughed. It was of course absurd. We've all heard of wives palming off on their husbands as false, a string of pearls that was real and expensive. That story is as old as the hills. And Mom, retelling the story, re continues, Thank you, I said, thinking of a little narrative of my own. <laughs> Eventually, the truth emerges. The governess had taken her own cheap pearls to be mended, and the jeweler had given her, by mistake, someone else's real pearls. The mistake is detected, the necklaces exchanged again, and the governess receives a reward that she uses to set herself up as a demi mondaine in Paris, presumably able to get her own real jewelry from rich lovers as the governess had substituted for a real member of high society, so real pearls had substituted chiasmically for her fakes. Morm makes fun of his own earlier story here in conscious self-parody, as well as the spirit of intertextuality, because he had, of course, stolen it from de Maupassant in the first place. In many old stories that my, from India and from all over the world, 
Shakespeare. <laughs> a man accuses a woman of unchastity only to have the woman produce the man's ring given to her on the occasion of their liaison to prove that it was the man, in fact, who was unchaste. The ring also validates the woman's child as the true heir. Think of the tale of Tamar and Judah in the Hebrew Bible, Genesis 38, or Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well, or Terence's Roman comedy, The Mother-in-Law, that I had the pleasure of discussing with your classics department last year, which is another one of these, the ring proves that the guy was the one who slept with the woman. In the modern stories of necklaces, the woman's jewelry given by the man proves, on the other hand, that she was, in fact, unchaste. Why this reversal? at this time. It's perhaps not a coincidence that this last group of stories about necklaces arises at a time, the mid and late 19th century, when women were agitating for their rights. It was at this time too in 1848 that Alexandre Dumas Père wrote his novel about an affair that actually had taken place in 1784 and 5 involving a fabulously expensive diamond necklace that was real enough but was falsely said to have been bought by Marie Antoinette or given to her by Cardinal de Rohan, who was falsely accused of having been the queen's lover. In fact, the cardinal had been tricked in the half-light of a garden at night by a prostitute who resembled and impersonated the queen, namely a fake queen, and who persuaded Rohan to buy the necklace which he thought was given to the queen but was actually broken up and sold. This is the history. The fictionalized versions are more lurid, and together they led to a notorious trial and contributed to the French Revolution. The 19th century stories may also reflect a class anxiety. A recurring theme in 19th century French novels is the shop girl who now dresses so well that she can pass herself off as a real lady. Recall that line in My Fair Lady, Shaw's Pygmalion, 1916, when Henry Higgins boasts that he'll be able to pass Eliza off as a duchess or even get her a job in a nice shop for which the standards would be still higher. <laughs> Here again, the real thing is not as good as the fake. And there's also the issue of language, of course, there too. So a couple of words of conclusion. What's the conceptual thread on which we can string all these gems of stories? There are a lot. The one I want to talk about now is the assumption that jewelry is somehow proof of sexual contact, whether it be the ring that proves that Kamar and Budor slept together or the necklace that proves the promiscuity of Max Kalada's dinner partner. And both sorts of jewelry are subject to the accusation of faking it, though in different ways. 19th and 20th century authors, de Maupassant, James, and Maum, are concerned with the paradoxical judgment that the fake may be more valuable than the real, a theme that has also become quite trendy in 20th and 21st century postmodernism. The wedding ring, on the other hand, the Doris Day ring, is the piece of jewelry that makes the wife a good woman. It's official marital, given to her by the unique man she's supposed to love, her legal man, her husband, in return for sleeping only with him and she damn well better keep it. If she loses it, she loses her authenticity. By contrast, a woman gets other forms of circular jewelry, necklaces or bracelets or anklets in India, or even other kinds of rings, the Marilyn Monroe jewelry from men, the plural is significant, other than her husband, in payment for sleeping with them, which makes her lose her authenticity. But if she can prove that jewelry is a fake or often, but not always the same thing and a more modern variant, if she can prove that she bought it herself, she remains authentic. And so Mr. Ramsey so smugly remarks, you'll be surprised to learn that Mrs. Ramsey bought that string at a department store the day before we left New York for $18. Considerations of the changing social context of these stories shift our focus to the outer level of the narrative frame, where the cross-cultural corpus of stories about fake jewelry shows us how widespread is the desire of male narrators to fake it, to cast moral aspersions on one of the few sources of women's independence, their jewelry. And I can say more about that, about how throughout 
recorded human history, women have uh, seldom, if ever, been allowed to own property, but they have had their own portable jewelry, their own portable property, their jewelry, which is also sometimes the portable property of the family, their husband's wealth as well. So jewelry has a lot of significance for independence. If a woman was beaten up just once too often by her husband and she could leave him and there was no legal divorce, she could at least exist if she could keep her jewelry. So there's that. In A String of Beads, Maul makes fun of his own earlier story in conscious self-parody, as well as a sophisticated awareness of the fact that if a story about fake jewelry is recycled often enough, like a woman passing from lover to lover, it is likely to be taken as false even if it is true. Oh, that's a story. We know that story. And here I want to say more in the book about the conventions of storytelling. Why it is that every time in Hebrew Bible, Genesis 38, Shakespeare, the guy says, I never saw you before, I never slept with you, and she says, yeah, what about the ring? And he says, oh my God, you're right. I've caught out. The ring doesn't prove anything. And there are a lot of stories that argue that it doesn't prove anything. There are later Jewish retellings in the Testament of Judah, of the story of Tamar and Judah, where she says, yeah, this is, what about this ring, hey, Judah? And he says, you could have gotten that ring from another woman. You could have stolen it. It proves nothing whatsoever. And yet there's a convention in the story that the ring will legitimate her. So it's considered, that if you know the story enough, it's taken to be false even if it's true. And if we jump from the concerns of the people inside the stories to the concerns of the narrators on the frames, we can see that another kind of faking it, which is the narrator's skill in maintaining the illusion and the audience's collusion with him, that if you can get someone's ring, you can prove that they slept with you, or that if you can prove that a woman has real jewelry that her husband did not give her, you can prove that she was unfaithful to him. The protagonists of these stories are primarily concerned with the chastity of the women, and therefore not so much with the genuineness of their jewelry as about its provenance. The big question is not, is the jewelry real, but what did the women do to get it? And the main evidence for the prosecution in the ongoing trial of chaste and unchaste women is the testimony of their beauty. We know nothing at all about Budor except that she is very beautiful and Chinese. We know absolutely nothing about Mrs. Ramsey, not her age, the color of her hair, whether she has children, whether she's smart or stupid, well-educated or up from the slums, except that she is, quote, a very pretty little thing and, quote, a pretty little wife. That's enough to damn them both. <laughs> jewelry and beauty play a game of doubles here. On the one hand, men give jewelry to beautiful women to get them to sleep with them. On the other hand, jewelry is said to enhance the beauty of women, to make them desirable so that men will want to sleep with them. It's a circle, like the circle of a necklace or a ring. Thank you.